So hi, everyone. Welcome to the PAR Center for Ethics at UNC Chapel Hill. I am coming to you direct from the PAR Center for Ethics up on the second floor of Caldwell Hall at UNC Chapel Hill. I'm Sarah Stroud. I'm the director of the PAR Center. And uh, it is a joy to welcome our latest distinguished visiting lecturer, Nancy Sherman. Um, I'll introduce Nancy in, in just a minute. Um, I'll give a very shortened version of the introduction that she merits. Um, but before I do that, I'll just mention that um, we have one last uh, talk this year, um, which is in the context of our joint PAR bioethics lecture series. And that's Hannah Picard from Johns Hopkins, who's gonna be visiting us actually in person that time uh, on the 19th of April. She'll be speaking about addiction. Um, so check out our website for information about that. We're also really looking forward to her visit. But for today, we're delighted to have Nancy Sherman with us. Nancy Sherman is distinguished university professor and professor of philosophy at Georgetown University. She's also a New York Times notable author, having written uh, books including After War, The Untold War, Stoic Warriors, and on the somewhat more scholarly ancient philosophy side, Making a Necessity of Virtue, The Fabric of Character, and as editor, Critical Essays on the Classics, Aristotle's Ethics. Nancy Sherman has written over 60 articles in the area of ethics, military ethics, the history of moral philosophy, ancient ethics, the emotion, moral psychology, and psychoanalysis. She lectures internationally on those topics, as well as moral injury and the emotions. She taught at Yale before joining the Georgetown faculty. And in the mid 90s, she served as the inaugural distinguished chair in ethics at the US Naval Academy, which I guess Nancy probably sparked your interest in thinking about specifically military ethics and stoic lessons uh, for mm -hmm. military matters. So her talk today, I suspect, pursues themes from her most recent book, Stoic Wisdom, Ancient Lessons for Modern Resilience, uh, available everywhere. Um, get it at your local independent bookstore or at uh, the online purveyor of your choice. Um, Nancy's gonna speak to us today on Stoics on Stuff. Nancy, please take it away. Let's Thank welcome you, our let's welcome our uh, our speaker. Thank you so much. Um, everything's good there. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> well, it is a delight. I'm sorry I can't um, be with you, but uh, COVID is a sneaky pest <laughs> in the air. So um, yes, this this um, elaborates on some themes from um, Stoic wisdom. And let me, let me begin with a sober historical event that involved massive uh, destruction of stuff. And it may have been the work of an enemy, internal or external. The history is indecisive here. And I have in mind the great fire in Rome of 64 that devastated a lot of Rome. Now, whether or not Nero fiddled while Rome burned, <laughs> um, assume arson was the act some internal enemy. And what's really critical is that the result was a fiery apocalypse uh, that devastated much of Rome, leaving half of the population homeless without shops, businesses to sustain the population, cultural heritage um, destroyed too. So the event forces a question that must have been on the minds of those that were uh, witnessing the conflagration. And that is essentially, um, uh, and the and the, by that I mean the um, the street philosophers uh, of the day. How do you react as a Stoic? Uh, and so Seneca, after all, was a young Nero's rhetoric tutor and minister uh, par excellence. And does Stoic philosophy force us to rethink our attachment to objects and our valuation of them as central to flourishing? Does it help to loosen our grip a little bit? So. Pushing the Socratic view to an extreme, um, the Stoics hold that virtue alone is sufficient for happiness. External goods, uh, all those outer goods that aren't themselves part of what the ancients thought of as your inner goodness, your excellent states of character, and those kinds of goods such as health, wealth, material objects, um, edifices, however much integral to 
security and subsistence, homeland history, culture. Um, all those the Stoics call indifference. And you should prefer um, many of them rather than disprefer them, but they're not the kinds of things that can make or break your happiness. So Rome may burn as Nero watches or wanders to the outer wilds of his empire, um, houses, shops, public baths, ovens, um, tombs, monuments may go up in smoke and the glories of a civilization too. But all of those are disasters, yes. But the task of Stoic wisdom is to be able to somehow endure the loss, prepare for the risks. Um, and so if Socrates and the Phaedo dubs philosophy as the practice of dying, then the Stoics double down on the claim and pronounce philosophy as the practice of pre-rehearsing loss. That's a way to frame it. If not inhumane, the view strikes many of us as the ugly austerity of Stoicism. And, it, and we may rehearse evils or what the Stoics famously call pre-rehearse the bads in order to practice loss. But to claim that the exercise isn't just protective, but there, but there are no real losses is to give too much credence to Stoicism's strange recalibration of values that dubs all goods that aren't excellences of character, false goods. Still, the Stoic view forces us to wonder if we don't at times fetishize material stuff or underestimate our resilience in the face of loss. The Stoics argue that if we wanna go on valuing things that are outside the kind of control we generally um, have over our characters and we should downgrade the value of those other things somehow and develop new kinds of attitudes towards them. And we should learn uh, attitudes that help mitigate risk. So given the practical bent of ancient Stoicism, especially as it comes to be shaped by the Romans, and here I have in mind uh, Epictetus, Marcus Aurelius, who read him in Seneca, it's not surprising that in our own time, modern Stoicism has become a wildly popular street philosophy. It competes with various forms of Eastern philosophies as practiced philosophy. And for some, it's nothing short of a secular religion. And perhaps that's not so surprising. Um, you know, uh, it's, it's a secular religion without tithings or a building fund. Um, but that said, it, it's not so surprising because Stoicism came to flourish um, just at the turn of the first millennium with many Judeo-Christian thinkers picking up shards of its view, whether it's Philo of Alexandria, Philo of Judea, as he's sometimes called, or Augustine or others. But in my view, the best way to cast Stoicism is as a reaction to Aristotle. Whether or not the Stoics read Aristotle, he was definitely in the air. So Aristotle, as we know, is, or some of us know, is commodious in what he'll include in the good life, the flourishing life. And this itself is a response to Plato. So at the end of book one of the Republic, Plato famously moves virtue and specifically justice inside the psyche or to the inside the soul. And his concern was really never about how you exercise that virtue once it's inside. It was much more that Socrates got it wrong. He was talking about conventional views of virtue when he buttonholed people in the marketplace and said, what is justice? What is piety? What is temperance? Um, now, Aristotle thinks that a, a, a possession of the state of character, as he himself says in the Nicomachean Ethics, is inadequate. A virtuous life spent fully asleep or tortured on the rack is no flourishing life. And Priam's loss of 13 sons in the Trojan War reverses his happiness. Still, Aristotle never really works out how you structure a composite notion of happiness that mixes external goods and persons and fortunes with the internal good of, of the virtues um, or even their exercise. So happiness becomes a bit of a messy rag bag and the view is somewhat unstable and the Stoics want to stabilize a more uh, a, a conception of happiness and they do so by drawing brighter stripes and inventing new terminology. External goods, as I said, become indifference 
uh, not constitutive of happiness or even real kinds of goods, but in the case of indifference that are prefer preferred, more like supportive conditions that are in most instances in a, in a way never really fully worked out uh, in accord with nature. So whatever the substantive value difference, the practical take home point for the Stoics is that preferring and dispreferring, selecting or diselecting as they say, involves not indifference, but a rational approach and avoidance attitude that steers clear, as I sometimes put it, of sticky acquisitiveness and panicky aversion. So they argue that we need to learn behaviorally and not just intellectually, um, new ways of wanting and rejecting that introduce a certain, you might say, lightness to our touch. Epictetus says, use impulse and aversion lightly and with reservation and in a reserved way. So how this attitude packs enough punch to make life worth living and not just a constant hedged bet is a key part of the critique of Stoicism that a rival group, Epicureanism, could level and does level, or you could easily reconstruct Aristotle's views along those lines. But my goal and in, in Stoic wisdom is to construct a credible Stoic account of, of how we invest in things outside our control in a way that doesn't fully unhinge us. Okay, so how do they begin to do it? Well, there's a lot of um, cobblestones to put in place, you might say, foundational elements. So um, they say that you have to assent to impressions. Um, and uh, the ones that concern us mostly today are the umphy ones, the, uh, the ones that are filled with impulse. So Seneca explains this way, anger is undoubtedly set in motion by an impression received of a wrong. But does it follow immediately on the impression and break out without any involvement of mind? Or is some assent by the mind required for it to be set in motion? Our view is it undertakes nothing um, without the mind's approval. So emotions become on their view a kind of voluntary action, something we will, they're volitional. And um, they also are cognitive, we frame um, our impressions propositionally through opinions or judgments. Aristotle had this kind of view in the rhetoric, but never in an organized way, in the way that the Stoics do, or as full as full throatedly, you might say, cognitivist or volitional for that matter. But there are a few things that are radical on this new account. The first is that the Stoics say you can actually learn to insert some pauses, as I tend to put it, um, before you say yay or nay to those impressions and then trigger a full-blown emotional response. Or at least you can slow down uh, your initial responses. Think not just fast, but slow, as Daniel Kahneman might put it. And that's because, as the Stoics argue, we toggle between different layers of emotional experience. So they posit three distinct layers of emotional experience. So one are these um, like sub-threshold emotional arousals, your body's talking, um, the flight, fight, freeze kind of responses that can be adaptive, but also maladaptive. Um, they come unbidden and depart unbidden, says Seneca. But we may also, he tells us, deliberately bid them adieu, you know? He says, you know, before they derail us, in, in essence, and he says this, quote, if anyone, he didn't speak French. So <laughs> if anyone thinks that pallor, falling tears, sexual excitement, or deep sighing, a sudden glint in the eyes or something similar are an indication of an emotion, he's wrong. He fails to see that these are just bodily agitations. Thus it is that even the bravest man often turns pale as he puts on his armors. The knees of the fiercest soldier tremble a bit as, he, as the signals given for battle and so on, a, a orator's hands can go numb. So um, he's saying essentially um, that these are uh, proto-emotions, we, we might call them pre-emotions, and they leave room for the stoic 
sage to experience them, to, to, to be able to experience them without uh, being impugned, without the sage's wisdom being impugned. Um, Philo of Alexandria, sometimes called Philo Judeus, um, sort of had a view of this. Well, Sarah laughed when she was told she was going to give birth at 100. You know, maybe it was ner nervous laughter, that kind of thing. So these are emotions that um, don't grab hold in lingering ways, in the way that full blown emotions or what they call ordinary emotions do. There's time to nip them in the bud, often, not, but not always, but, but, but often. And actually on the subject of knees knocking, I was just listening to NPR um, two mornings ago and a, a combat medic front lines in Ukraine said, yes, my adrenaline's flowing. She's dealing with compression injuries, concussions. Yes, my knees knock. She actually used that phrase. Yes, um, but uh, they're nerves, but I get over it quickly. And it's that kind of notion that the, that the Stoics are thinking about. So what are the full-blown ordinary emotions? That's a second layer. These are the, uh, all the emotions that we know. Um, and unlike Aristotle, who you know, has chapters in the rhetoric uh, cataloging all the emotions, they just wanna have four. Everything falls under these four classifications. So one is, uh, they're all uh, thinking about goods or bads in the offing or in the present, uh, desire, a good in the offing in the future, fear a bad in the offing in the future, um, pleasure, something you're experiencing or did experience that's um, enjoyable and uh, a, 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 or a good that's enjoyable and um, distress, a, a bad that, that, that you are experiencing or experienced. So, and in addition, within those emotions, each of those emotions, there's two tiers two evaluations. One is an evaluation that, as I just mentioned, that there's a good or bad in the offing. And the other is how it's apt to respond. So there's um, the cognition as well as a, added, a cognitive evaluation about a, a, a fitting behavioral response. Now, there are problems with the ordinary emotions. And one the Stoics love to tell you about, and that is they're excessive. And this is Kant picks up on this clearly. They they run away on you, you know. Give them an inch and they take a mile. Um, it's like a runner in stride. You can't they can't stop. Or you're at the edge of a precipice, says Seneca, and you lean over a little bit too far and you're in free fall. There's no going back. So it's that kind of excessiveness. But in addition, there's misvaluation. They tend to they tend not always they tend to attach to objects in the world that they think are uh, false, are not the genuine goods and bads. They're, they're the external goods. Um, they attach to what they call indifference and the proper attitude to indifference shouldn't be these emotions, but should be preference or dispreference, a kind of rational avoidance and, and um, rational going toward. So when you prefer or disprefer wisely, you're not hovering in you know, some transcendent platonic heaven. You're in the world, you're trafficking in the world of things and beautiful objects, um, people that you love, um, brick and mortar, mud and dirt, all that stuff. You're, you know, Plato puts it disparaging, lovers of sight and sounds. But what you're trying to do when you, as you move in that world is loosen yourselves a bit from too tight a clutch or too desperate a need. So you have to always remember the doctors are, the Stoics are doctors of the soul. That's what they call themselves, uh, doctors of the psyche. And they wanna help you find pockets of resourcefulness, ways you can pivot, find agility so that that can take root in your emotional repertoire. So that puts us to a third layer of emotional experience. And, that, and we're not capable of it. It's idealized, uh, the sage um, experiences them, but they're rational desire, rational fear, and rational pleasure. Maybe a little like Kant's practical emotions. I've never been able to figure out if that's a one-for-one -one swap there. But the idea is that they are um, um, 
ways where you don't get stuck in the clinginess or the panickiness. And there's no um, good emotion of distress because distress um, is a, a, a sage experiences, um, the only object of distress is really sort of, if, you, if you're really like hooked on vice and the sage isn't. So we'll come back to that in a moment. So where does this put us? It actually puts us in the idea that you're trying to, uh, given we live in a world of objects and persons, we're, we're trying to free ourselves from its yoke a bit, they suggest. And the, there's no surprise that the wealthy in, in, in Silicon Valley sometimes go for this because they, you know, the, the Seneca appeals to them. He's always in tension between all the halls of marble that he lives in and wanting to have a mattress that barely shows the imprint of his body. You know, a straw pallet will do a single grain of rice, but then he, you know, goes for oysters and not mushrooms that he can forage. <laughs> so, so what are some of these techniques for trying to um, um, uh, minimize or manage risk, mitigate risk? One I mentioned earlier, and that is pre-rehearsing the bads, pre-rehearsing evils, it's sometimes said. So Cicero, not himself a Stoic, but a redactor of the texts, uh, an editor, um, approvingly quotes a, a fragment from Euripides. I learned from a wise man over time, says Euripides, I pondered in my heart the miseries to come, a death untimely or the sad escape of exile or some other weight of ill, rehearsing so that if by chance some of them should happen, I'd not be unready nor torn suddenly with pain. So um, in turn, Euripides, takes a lesson from the pre-Socratic and Anaxagoras, who famously says, and my students always are mortified by this, an interesting word I just used, I knew my child was mortal. I always knew my child was mortal <laughs> if you're told that your child has predeceased you. So the idea is to regularly rehearse potential future evils and mitigate um, the shock of accidental of accident or tragic loss. And they claim that if you do this, you can kind of mute some of the freshness, the visceralness of the, of the, um, of the loss. It's a, a bit of advanced exposure. So we're, many of us are familiar with um, prolonged exposure therapy. It's used often as a form of cognitive behavior therapy. Um, it's, a, it's a desensitization of traumatic triggers. Um, and some of the cognitive behavioral therapists early on, Albert Ellis and, and um, Aaron Beck actually attribute stoicism to, to their uh, inspiration. Um, so the idea is through repeated approach in, a, in the context of a trusting environment uh, where, and a safe environment, you, you decondition the trigger a bit. That's the idea. Now, the Stoics want pre-exposure uh, desensitization, you might say. Um, and that, that's actually been studied a bit. Um, it's called a attention bias um, modification. So the idea in IDF, Israeli Defense Force, has been playing around with this and here to the national, uh, near my house, National Institutes of Mental Health. So the idea is to learn to shift attention so that you develop perceptual and cognitive resources for focusing not just on threat, um, but on neutral, uh, neutral stimuli. So, and research suggests that if you have this kind of advanced training to, of shifting your focus between threat and unthreatening stimuli, it helps to reduce anxious hypervigilance, which is what PTSD is. It's, it's very anxious and an unmodulated hypervigilance that in some ways outlives its adaptiveness. Um, and so the idea is to make the response to stress cues adaptive, agile, and elevate the response acutely in threatening situations as in combat, but train it to be transient so that it recedes in safe circumstances. 
Now you can put a stoic gloss on this, I think. Train in advance to withhold inappropriate assent to impressions of thread, of threat by retreading al alternate, alternate patterns of assent to impressions of common safety. So you have other things in your repertoire is the idea. I mean, the psychologists are, are interested in subliminal um, uh, exposures. Uh, the Stoics obviously are not doing that. But the idea is to try to have a, an, alt, alt, an alternative way of thinking about certain kinds of threats. So Epictetus actually develops this idea and he suggests go for it incrementally. And so he has this idea, keep increasing the stakes. So in the case of everything that attracts to you or it has as uses or you're fond of, keep in mind to tell yourself you could lose it and begin with the most trivial thing. He starts with a jug. And I sometimes think about this, you know, we have some pottery we really like that's in the kitchen or clumsy. <laughs> I could break it very easily. I know that some of the pottery, British studio pottery is not replaceable. The guys are not with us anymore who made this stuff. So I, you know, I think about it a little bit. Um, I arm myself a little bit with this. Then he says, widen your sphere of practice. You're gonna go to the public bathhouse. Well, it could be filled with, with pickpockets or, um, or, or gossipers. Well, I, I swim a lot and you know, I go to a public pool and could be filled not with so much pickpockets, but a lot of noisy teenagers. So hogging the lane. So I got to think in advance if I don't want to get angry about this. Um, and then of course there's death. Now this one I have some familiarity with. My mother never wanted to talk about death. She was approaching a hundred and we still didn't have the conversation. She was in a nursing home. So I decided I had to make a joke of it. It was very epic TV. I sort of said, you know, mom, just remind me, did we sign you up for the immortality plan because if we did it's going to be really expensive and that brought a laugh <laughs> and i knew we were on the same page and we were now talking about death <laughs> so we were pre-rehearsing death in some way and so that was my epictetan moment with my mom <laughs> um so pre-rehearse the evils so there's another um common method some may know about called mental reservation. Add a tack on to your intentions. You'll do it unless, uh, you know, circumstances aren't propitious for doing it. So Seneca says, I'll go for a boat, bus. I'll go sailing unless something interferes. It's kind of hedge your bets. Um, now, how do you do that exactly? I sometimes think of Virginia Woolf, if any of you remember having your heads, the opening lines of um, To the Lighthouse. I'm in a total Virginia Woolf um, uh, moment. <laughs> um, uh, little James looks outside. It doesn't look very good in the Hebrides. Kind of looks out like what I see outside. A lot of rain right now and gray. Um, he says, are we gonna go to the lighthouse? And his mother, who I think is actually Virginia Woolf's mother, um, says, if it doesn't rain or if the weather is good. She constantly prepares him for the possibility that they might not go. And that's what the whole book is about. Will they get to the lighthouse? Um, and so when you think about that, so is it a little bit like, uh, I was thinking how to understand this. Is it a little bit like a car airbag that inflates the moment there's an accident, you know, too good to be true. You're kind of, you're saved from the accident. That didn't sound so good. Maybe I was thinking maybe a little bit more in the financial model. Past performance is no guarantee of future results, says every prospectus you've ever got. So now the Stoics are not marketers, you know, market timers. <laughs> And in fact, they're very, uh, they, they buy into the cynic creed to deface the coinage or money is a kind of evil in the way that if any of you are old enough as I am to remember Abby Hoffman, street theater, got somehow made his way onto the 
onto the gallery of Wall Street and started floating $20 bills down in order to upend Wall Street that day. So the stocks are a little closer to that model. But even so, the idea is that you should update your information as quickly as you can. And if you're a sage, you can do that pretty easily because you are always um, one step ahead. Um, you, you keep up with fluid epistemic landscapes that you're probably infallible. That's how you do it. We're not as lucky, but they try to have you practice some kind of cognitive agility or at least unmoor un yourself from some of the emotions that make you stick to having to have a scenario work out a specific way. So <clears throat> I found, you know, I was writing this book, uh, Stoic Wisdom, at least during the pandemic and thinking about a lot of these cases. And I, I found the idea of being prepared and trying to be one step ahead and trying to pivot quickly, um, actually helpful lessons in getting by and in thinking, you know, that had we been better prepared on many on many fronts, um, uh, we would have done better in some in some cases. So it's very much about preparation, um, I think, uh, 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 and also knowing the emotions that travel with hard times um, and trying to uh, not be unfamiliar to those emotions. So let's just return where we began, um, attachment to stuff, persons, it's lost through fires or massive devastation, arson, war, or nature, and return to Seneca. So Seneca is really a, a hypocritical figure. There's no other way to think about it, I think. He uses oratorical flourishes to dazzle. Um, he indulges in the excesses of palatial luxury, but then excoriates himself for it. He, as I said, he aspires to aesthetic sim uh, simplicity, but not so secretly revels in an aesthete's taste for patterned marble and statuary. I mean, you can see him beating his chest often, but it's a wink, wink, and a nod, nod. Or you know, he he wishes he were uh, he wishes he were pure. Um, so, what does catch him by surprise is a fire. And it's a fire in Lyon, ancient Lyon, not Rome, but a Roman colony. Um, and it probably took place after the Great Fire. Um, and Seneca's remarks give us a concrete sense of how he thinks about pre-rehearsing loss and the place of distress and grief and to um, friendship. It's in a letter to Lucilius, Lucilius, and these letters are very important. They give you a, a sense of the importance of friendship in Seneca's account. Our friend Lib uh, Liberalis is quite upset at news of the fire that, he, that has completely consumed the municipality of Lyon. Lugdunum, I believe is the Roman colony. The catastrophe could have shaken anyone, says Seneca. Seneca. Um, let alone a person deeply devoted to his native land. It's left him searching for the mental toughness with which he had undoubtedly armed himself against what he thought were possible objects of fear. Now says Seneca, I'm not surprised though that he had no advanced fears of this disaster, so unforeseen and virtually unimaginable. It was unprecedented. Fire has troubled many cities, but not to the point of completely annihilating them. Even when buildings have been set alight by enemy action, many places escape destruction. Such a range of splendid structures, any one of them capable of embellishing a city all by itself, and a single night has leveled them all. So, Seneca is clearly shocked by the magnitude of what happened. And he admits that it's hard to know how one could concretely prepare for what seems unimaginable. And so he suggests there's always gotta be room for grief, distress, sorrow, and pain, even amongst those who are 
trying to become stoic. And it's in the company of friends. He, in these letters, um, even if a literary art form, that he wants to grieve. But you got to ask yourself, is there room for healthy distress in a philosophy that's built on eliminating stress? In the catalog of good emotions, I said there was no distress. Um, there, there's a uh, caution, wariness, there's a rational desire, and there's a rational pleasure, kind of charitable sense, sensibility, divine joy, but no, no, no distress. But none of us are sages, and as moral aspirants, we seek and not need guidance, and that's what these Stoics are in the business of doling out all the time. And the complaint is registered most forcefully by Cicero. So he's just lost his daughter in childbirth, Tulia. He was very close to her and he's escaped to the Tusculan hillside. And he's looking for comfort in the self-help of the day. And of course he turns to stoicism. And he says, um, I pass over the method of Cleantes. That's the second Stoic um, head of Greek school, since that's directed at the wise person who doesn't need consoling after all. For if you manage to persuade the bereaved person, the bereaved person, sorry, that nothing is bad but shameful conduct, then you've taken away not his grief, but his unwisdom. But this is not the right moment for such a lesson. So the idea then is, you know, a sage's wisdom loosens him from the hold of attachment that clings. But if you're immortal in the throes of loss, a Cicero mourning his child, the loss of a city, then being taught a sage's wisdom, especially at the moment of loss, is at very least, as therapists would say, bad timing. But is there room for a stoic intervention that's gentler? Now, remember, uh, the stoic emotions are double tiered. There's the evaluation that that has taken place and how you should how you should behaviorally respond in a fit or meet way. And Cicero says in this regard, he finds Chrysippus's method helpful because he doesn't deny that a bad has taken place, but he says maybe you can find a different way of behaving. At least your outer comportment might be different. But even here, he says, this behavioral change is a hard pill to swallow in the throes of loss. It's a big task to persuade someone, says Cicero, that he's grieving by his own judgment and because he thinks he ought to. In other words, the tears come, it, it just, they fall. Um, behavior modification at this moment of, of, of acute loss is hard. But I just want to say Seneca is no uh, a foe to tears. What, he's a, what he finds problematic are forced tears, theatrics, a kind of the, the Sturm und Drang of, 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 of shedding, of, of, of um, going in for performance. Uh, he says natural tears that, that flow naturally are involuntary. They're kind of the part of those involuntary arousals. And um, as long as they're not feigned, uh, he finds them okay. So again, the, fo the foe is forced tears, not public tears. And Cicero is ever concerned with the public persona. I mean, he wants to get to the forum. Uh, he doesn't want Caesar seeing that he's not there. So he's trying maybe to overexert his, <laughs> his outer demeanor. Um, and Seneca himself says, you know, I once cried really hard for at the loss of Aeneas Serenus, um, unrestrainedly, he says. And remember, and he, you know, he's the doctor, but he often says, I'm the patient as well. I am giving counsel to myself. Um, and so he thinks, I think, pre-rehearsal has its limits because this guy was much younger. And so Seneca hadn't really thought about someone, a friend who's much younger, predeceasing him, and he was caught off guard. Um, so not all the methods, just like my, you know, my water mitigation methods in my house aren't foolproof. <laughs> These methods are not foolproof, but they give you some, um, uh, 
some ammo. Um, but if you're in the storm, are you in it alone as a Stoic? And uh, I think popular modern Stoicism, and maybe they got it from the Victorians and the stiff upper lip, et cetera, often, which actually I think is a, an American phrase, um, often conjures up a picture of go it alone grit, um, self-reliance. Um, you may not retreat to the inner citadel, but you find strength in your inner resources and resilience is inner strength. And what seems to just fade from the picture are this, all the social supports of resilience, which we know are critical. We know as 21st century individuals are critical, but they seem to fade in some of the snapshots you get of, of modern stoicism. And I, I think that just reads stoicism wrong. It's not the legacy of stoicism. Uh, take for example, Marcus's meditations. He's writing to himself at nightfall. He's the general, the commander. He's on the shores of the Danube. Um, as a military leader, he knows what, what's a cadre. He's uh, how you keep it together. He reflects on the day and he says this. Uh, he's, he's also probably looking at the detritus of the day. Um, and so he says, what a per he, he talks about dismembered hands and legs, arms apart from the trunk. He says, when a person cuts himself off from society, it's like cutting yourself off from the whole to which you belong and to which your limbs belong. You can't thrive from the political and social whole of which you are a part. And then he says, we have to work together. We're like feet or hands or eyelids, or one of my favorite passages, like the rows of upper and lower teeth, you know, when you don't need an orthodontist, when they're in sync and they work together. Um, so the stoic notion is a, a very common phrase is to be at home in the world. And when you're at home in the world, you're a citizen of the cosmos. So not just the polis of Aristotle, but the, the cosmos, you're a world citizen. Diogenes, the author of that uh, term, when asked, where are you from? He says, I'm a citizen of the universe from essentially from everywhere and nowhere. Um, and th these ideas are very key in Zeno's, um, uh, Zeno of Kidium's uh, Republic, only fragments of which remain. But Marcus was probably telegraphing the idea when he says, we're woven together intertwined by a common bond in a loving relationship, uh, one thing scarcely foreign to another. So it's this idea of humanity and a humanity, a commonwealth of reason, undoubtedly Kant was thinking of this uh, when he fashioned his views. So social grit, I think, is stoic grit. Um, it's the common bonds that help us endure loss when Rome burns or Lyon is devastated, or you can't read this stuff without thinking of Kiev, Kiev, Kiev Kartov, firebombed and indiscriminate acts of war, or the treasures and culture of Pal Palmyra destroyed by the Islamic State in order to blot out history. Are the Stoics really saying we acquiesce, we retreat, we find peace in meditation that takes us out of the world, away from its stuff? attachments or loved ones and all the meaning that that invests? Do they shrug their shoulders? And when I was reading about a, 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 an archeologist and a curator um, who was trying to hold on to the, the treasures at the Cathedral of St. Sophia, 11th century Byzantine structure, um, which is a UNESCO World Heritage in, in the heart of Kiev. I don't know if it survived, but he was trying very hard to protect the culture from massive shelling rained down by Russian bombs. I wanna argue, no, I don't think the Stoics are arguing that you retreat fully. I, they don't practice indifference, at least a credible Stoicism and the best of Stoicism doesn't. The Stoic um, practice is to try to manage fears and distress. The Stoics always have emotional skin in the game. We remain attached, but we try to cultivate the kind of love that knows a measure of prudence and finds ways to be nimble 
and adaptive when that's required. We remain alert and cautious. We know fear, but fear that knows courage and resistance. We mourn deeply, we wail, we cry, but in ways that no being at home in the world always requires the support and sustenance and material assistance that comes from being connected to others. So I think that's the Stoic consolation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Nancy Sherman. My pleasure. I don't know if uh, we have the ability to clap virtually, but I certainly clap uh, my actual hands for you. Okay, so we're going to move into discussion. Um, anyone who would like to ask a question, you do have the ability or you should to raise your hand um, and we will call on you and let you ask your question, um, which maybe I will, I'll, I'll just take advantage maybe of my, my bully pulpit to, to ask you something, Nancy. Um, I mean, I loved that, first of all, that was really, really captivating, thank you. Um, and I particularly appreciated the emphasis on um, that this is not an individualistic um, dogma where, you know, you go off and, and sort of purely work on yourself, um, you know, alone, but that rather it centrally involves friends and, and social connections, you know, when you do experience what mere mortals would call loss or misfortune. Um, but I, I wondered if, do we understand, as it were, by what mechanism uh, grieving with friends or other social connections is supposed to help you? Because I, I guess what I'm taking away from how they could be helpful is that your friends would um, you know, try to persuade you that really you haven't suffered any loss when, you know, your husband died or whatever, that, you know, that, that their help would have to consist in trying to reinforce the idea that you haven't really suffered a misfortune, that all of this is actually just indifferent. Um, and that, you know, and I guess that, that sounds pretty creepy. Um, I would mm -hmm. hope that that's not, you know, the picture of how our, our friends are supposed to help, even if in some sense that proposition is true, that you haven't truly suffered a loss of anything genuinely good because these things are indifferent, it seems rather horrible for it to be your friend's job to, um, you know, emphasize and, and underline that and, and try to, um, you know, get you to see that. So yeah, just wondering if you can say more about how friends and, and other social connections are supposed to help in the light of these kinds of events. So, um, Maybe I'll say three things. So one is you see uh, friendship uh, in the case of loss and grief, uh, for example, in, in Seneca's letters. So, you know, whether or not the letters actually left his house and he got new ones, it's a bit of a literary art form. Um, he's, uh, he, he's in this sort of relationship. And now, the, they do, there is a sense that, uh, as you say, with, you know, false value, the false valuation, putting that Aristotle somehow uh, fell into, that virtues, uh, if not, if aren't different, he, it, Aristotle didn't make them different enough, right? He didn't make external goods and external relations different enough. But when push comes to shove, in actual practice, I mean, Seneca, when he commits suicide on grounds that he was conspiring against the uh, death of Nero, the Bessonian conspiracy, he's surrounded by friends. So it's kind of Socratic scene. You know, it's not working well and they're there to kind of be with him. There's a great um, Rubens uh, portrait of him in that regard. Um, secondly, um, Cicero in a sort of a stoic moment says, you know, um, Mausolus' wife got it wrong. She went and grieved every single day. And hence we get this word mausoleum, you know? So they're, they're trying to ward against what I would, or, or is often called chronic grief syndrome, where you never are able to get over grief. It's not that, the, you know, they don't have the methods that we have or, or uh, specifics that we might 
you know, the steps and grieving that we might have and whatnot. And, you know, they are Romans. And so there is a, a certain kind of decorum. Um, but there's a wonderful, um, this is my sort of third point. Uh, in the play, um, um, Hercules Rages, a Seneca play, and I think it was written by Seneca. I talk about it in the book. Um, Hercules, Heracles, he, he pierces through the world. It's his last labor and he's finally home. And Juno, his stepmother, um, was always always very envious of him because he's, he's, the, he's the son of, of, of Jupiter through a different, a, a different wife. So she's, the labors were her trick. And now she's, he's going to have to endure one more labor. And the labor that he has to endure is that he kills his family, actually. You know, he goes into one of these blind, psychotic, dissociative moments. And um, she's, she's orchestrating and he kills his wife. And when he comes to, sort of a scene almost like Ajax, um, Sophocles Ajax, when he comes to, he realizes what happened and he wants to kill himself and, you know, probably does in the end. But his father and his best friend try to stay his hand. And they say, you, um, his father says, you didn't do the deed, someone else did. And then his best friend says, use your heroic courage or your famed courage to stay your hand. And what they're trying to say is, you may not be able to show self-compassion, but I'm mirroring it for you. And you use that compassion to find self-empathy or some mercy. And I, I was very moved to see this in this play because I know this is a technique that's used a lot by the VA. Um, so, so service members come home absolutely devastated by what they did deliberately, uh, not deliberately, permissive rules of engagement or accidents, you name, the whole nine yards. And they're very suicidal, um, uh, whether it's survivor guilt or just many forms of, of um, horrific suffering, enduring horrific anguish, moral anguish. And one of the techniques is to sort of bring someone in the room if it's a, if it's a child that you were unable to save or a, or a buddy that, survived, uh, that, that died, but you survived, bring them into the room in a therapy and ask them, it's an empty chair, but ask them, do they hold you as accountable as you hold yourself accountable? Um, you sort of flip the perspective. And we, we always flip the perspective. I mean, that's what we do as parents all the time. We provide another perspective as friends. So there are those resources. Are they the ones always used? No, the Stoics are trying to toughen you up a little bit, but, but they also know, they constantly tell us we're connected to each other. So this would be a healthy way of, <laughs> of helping in grief. Yeah, thank you. That's, that's, that's definitely a lot, a lot less creepy. Thanks. <laughs> Um, Ash Santos. Ash is one of our undergraduate students uh, affiliated with, uh, with us at the PAR Center. So Ash, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm not as familiar with the Stoic writings, but what you're talking about reminds me, I can't remember what chapter it is in the Zhuangzi, but uh, Zhuangzi's wife dies uh, and one of his friends comes to visit him afterwards and finds him like singing and playing on a basin and everything. And his friend asks in kind of a shocked way, like, how could you do this? Like, didn't you honor and love your wife and all that stuff? And Zhuangzi goes through a thing of talking about like, well, yes, of course, when I first learned, I was very sad and cried and all that stuff. And then I thought about a time before she was born. And like, he, it sounds like he's almost expanding out his awareness to like, you know, she didn't exist always and things change with the season. And I'm just kind of going back into where I am in the present moment and it's you know that's where I am now mm -hmm. sort of a thing and so it's making me think like um if there's a difference between maybe those two philosophies it seems like the stoics are saying we should try to make the world a good place and protect these things and all this stuff but also accept that inevitably things die and there's going to be failure and don't let that get in the way of what it is we're trying to do versus Zhuangzi seems to be more just like, just be in the moment, let things happen. 
um, so there's that similar accept your place in the world and then just go with the flow versus like accept that stuff's going to go wrong and push on ahead to try to accomplish the thing that you should be trying to accomplish. Does that make sense? Great. Yeah, sure. Sure. That's a very good question. I'm not that familiar, but here's a few um, thoughts about what you said that maybe um, help out a little bit. Um, the Stoics don't so much have a sense of the present or be in the present or nor also um, the sense of, of, um, of uh, letting go so that you can really understand the, the present now um, at this moment now. If anything, they're they're very hard on themselves. I mean, <laughs> they beat themselves up a lot. You know, this is not an easy philosophy. They're, you know, there's a finger wagging a lot of the time. They're, you know, always trying to make yourself make yourself better and you failed. Seneca meditates you know, at the end of the day, it wouldn't put anyone to sleep. It would make you more anxious given um, the way you can self-excoriate. That said, they believe in a certain way in which you're part of a greater universe. And, and if, you, if you had some sort of infallible knowledge, you would know how that universe worked. And, and how, you know, if your feet were destined to get muddy, they would, they, they get muddy. And so, you know, go for it. If you're destined to be diseased, then then go for it, that sort of thing. So it's a, it's a little bit more, it, rather than a sense of, of uh, embrace the present, it's a bit more embrace your place in a providential cosmos, you know? And that will give you some greater bearing or sense of, sense of place. So, you know, also Buddhism in a certain way, that, not necessarily the view you're now speaking about, but, but many comparisons are drawn. They're really about detach from the self or at least um, get rid of the narcissism and, 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 and way in which you focus on self. The Stoics really want you to have a, a, a strong sense of self, of the psyche that, that will be the place where virtue is... Um, cultivated and that you um, spend your time improving. So, yeah. But well, thank you hey. for that question. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Ash. So we have two people who've put questions into the Q&A, which is, which is also fine. But if you'd like to actually ask them verbally, um, then we'll go to James Jocelyn, followed by Z Kwanbeck. Shit. James, do okay. you want to go ahead and ask your question verbally? Yes. Um, I um, was curious. I know Stoics, you want to control the things you can and not worry about the things you can't control. But I'm thinking of um, in this day and age, particularly in politics, there seems to be so much dirty play going on that you may be hindered by your virtue. For instance, um, you want to win an election, you do everything you can, but you want to attain your virtue. And then all of a sudden you get some dirt on someone. Do you release it when you know darn well that it's not temperate or virtuous to do so? It may win the election. And maybe you're not, you remain virtuous and you lose the election and you say, well, that's fine. I kept my virtue. Or you sell out, so to speak, compromise, win the election, are able to uh, uh, get policy initiatives that make a big difference in the world. And there may be, quote, a greater good being served. So good. I was curious, as, at what point do you let go and say it's beyond my control? At what point do you, you know, rapidly refuse and fight to the very end, so to speak? So the Stoics are interesting in this regard because they really are in the world of dirty politics. It doesn't come much dirtier than that. You know, and they're also like a lot of the service members I work with, you know, there's huge hierarchies of power. Um, you can't get stuff done and you try very hard and you buck, you're, you know, you're up against stupid bureaucracies, mammoth um, uh, bureaucracies. Um, so, you know, Dirty hands and politics kind of go together a bit. 
Um, Michael Walzer, I think, had that right. And also, purity is not not always the right it's not always rational caution, if you want to use their own terms, or prudential caution, sometimes it's thought of as, um, or, or even um, a, a, a sense of your own virtue versus the virtue of a larger group. You're constantly making compromises. And I think anyone that, the Stoics were, were constantly uh, they're in the world of politics, military and politics, the dirtiest places you could be in some way, in some ways. <laughs> <laughs> and they know that there's uh, ways in which their actions are going to impact other people's actions. Um, and so Seneca actually goes into retirement political. I mean, he's banished. To this. I mean, he's banished for seven or eight years initially, um, uh, only called out called back by Nero's mother, Agrippina, because she wants the best rhetorician to teach her son. And that's Seneca. He comes out of Corsica, I think, in the day back then was not the Corsica we know now. It's not a place where you go for a vacation. It's pretty awful, I think. And so they know what it is to be banished, to be isolated. And Seneca actually voluntarily banishes himself, goes into retirement when he writes the letters because he um, is on the outs with Nero and hopes to sort of save his skin a little bit. So I think they're very, very aware of the pushes and pulls. And it's actually because they are so aware that they have this aspiration to be, you know, more of the philosopher king, you know, but they know they're going to go back into the cave and they actually know how dirty the cave is. Um, mm. So, you know, um, not naive, I don't think at all. I see. Thank you. Thank you. Good question. Thanks, James. Z Quanbeck, do you want to ask your question? I'm just sure. looking for you to unmute you. There you go. Am I unmuted? Yes, you are. Okay. Yes. Okay. And Nancy, by the way, Z is one of our graduate students in philosophy in the department. Hi hey there. And hi to all. I think Thank this, you is, this is really interesting. So I think my question is uh, following up on Sarah's in some respect. So I was trying to figure out how uh, the discussion of social connection and social support fits into Stoic ethics more broadly. In particular, I guess I was wondering if you could say more about how your preferred version of Stoicism uh, thinks about the relationship between social connection or social support and happiness. Um, so is, is the idea that like, social connection or social support despite not being an external good is necessary for virtue in some way and thus it's necessary for happiness. I think it's more like a, an instrumental or more contingent relationships because uh, social connection or social support will help us to cultivate virtue uh, and thus happiness. Should we think about it in terms of being a preferred and different or is there some other way of thinking about the relationship between social connection and social support and happiness? They don't, thank you so much. They don't spell it out as much as you know, any commentator working on ancient texts would like, but they, you know, uh, so in that regard, they're as guilty as you might say Aristotle is for not giving us the full uh, nine yards on how to think about these disparate goods. But they think that it, you will, you try to have wise selecting. So they're thinking not so mo much about uh, how you put subordinate goods and the only real good together in a conception of happiness. It's only the only thing, they're Socratic, the only thing that is constitutive of well being is virtue. That said, they definitely want to cultivate attitudes and habits of, I'll call it approach and avoidance. And, uh, and 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 with affective charge that allow you to be able to um, it, it enjoy friends without being fully unhinged at loss. They want you to be able to enjoy material goods without being helpless in the face of 
destruction. Now, you heard from Seneca, there are some destructions that are so unimaginable and that are so quick, and one can think of Ukraine at the moment, that leave you somewhat unprepared. And as much pre-rehearsal of death and pre-rehearsal of loss will still leave you without the rational approach and avoidance behavior. They want to, at very least, give you alternatives in your emotional repertoire than we typically cultivate. You know, we're, many of us know about rage control, that sort of thing. They are going in for certain ways of a, a full smorgasbord of how to view these kinds of alternative ways. Do they come? They will end at the end of the day there will be one good that is in happiness or flourishing eudaimonia, and that is virtue. But your virtue is wisdom, and wisdom is in selecting the indifference in ways that on this occasion are preferable versus not preferable. I mean, yeah, each, each discern the particular case by case. Uh, um, health by and large is good, but there could be occasions where, I don't know, you know, if you're healthy, you're, you can do what the tyrant wants you to do or something like that. So you go for disease because you won't um, do it in those kinds of circumstances. So they are, um, you know, they're very, I, I get why they're having their day amongst people that really are looking for practice philosophy. I mean, I, I'm not a student of Buddhist philosophy, but one of my colleagues, Bryce Huebner is, and you know, and he really views Stoicism and Buddhism as kind of practice philosophies in some ways. And, and I get, I think they're, where they make their contribution is in actually being A, cognitivists with regard to the emotions, very prescient, telling us we have these different layers of emotions and giving us ways that you can actually think about the sort of thing, like say Joe Ledoux, he has these low road and high road emotions in neurobiology. Um, and you know, he's really thinks that there are different tracks by which you um, process emotionally. And I, I think the Stoics were onto that. Mm -hmm. And that's a very interesting contribution to, uh, if not what is in happiness, how to try to become happy. <laughs> Maybe that's the way of putting it. Thank Thanks, you. Nancy. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Z. Um, we had a question from Laura Goulian. Is she still with us? So we can come back to you, Ash. Go ahead. Yeah, so- uh, Oh, I see, thank you. Kind of yeah. a follow-up question of what was just discussed. Um, so the this summer I lost my father pretty unexpectedly. And it was a thing where uh, at one point I felt like there was a decision between just like losing it and being overwhelmed by the sadness of stuff or being able to show up and help plan the funeral and fly people out from different places and all that kind of stuff. And so I'm uh, something you said about like, the Stoics viewing themselves as, as wanting to become philosopher kings and everything. I was wondering if maybe the interpersonal aspect of it isn't so much of them trying to find support in other people and everything, but ensuring that they are in a state where they are able to be the support. But I, I didn't know if that was accurate or not. Well, that's a great. Well, first of all, I'm sorry for your loss and um, you. sudden loss. It does unmoor. And I, I think the Stoics... Uh, acknowledge that, uh, at least Seneca certainly acknowledges that. Um, the idea of being not just uh, being a mutual support. So you're there for others as well as others are there for you. I, I, I think that's, that's, that's right. Um, and, you know, they view uh, uh, our place in the world, uh, being at home in the world is this way of, um, it, one of the early um, Stoics, maybe actually not so early, fifth century, I think, 
um, has this idea of concentric circles that you're in the center and your job is to constantly bring those that are in nesting circles closer in, ultimately to the, to the far reaches of the cosmos. So it's a very much a kind of Adam Smith-like moment. You trade, you know, through some sort of imaginative transfer, they actually use the idea of zealously trying to bring in the outer circle so that they feel more like the inner ones. So the idea is that you, you shrink the world a little bit um, by letting others in, but also so that you connect outward. I mean, it's a two-way street. That's part of it. And maybe the best way to capture this metaphor is one that um, I'm just reminded now, Seneca in um, on benefits or benefactions has this wonderful image of, he has two in, images, but one is a game of catch. And you're often in benefaction, so you can view um, being supported in grief as a kind of gift that we give to others, a way of helping them. You're always in a, um, a, 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 a call and response. And so you have to both throw the ball in a way that someone can catch, he says, you know, think of throwing it too high, too fast, too low. And also the person who catches in an act of gratitude has to be able to throw it back in a way that the thrower can catch and keep the ball in motion. And I think of those kinds of emotion exchanges, interpersonal interactions, whether it's in supporting each other in grief or in joy uh, when there isn't a loss, but there's a celebration, as this moment of figuring out how to be attuned to each other in the way that's so critical, obviously, for in young children's lives with parents. But I think also in mourning, you know, it's, um, you know what a remark, how off a remark can sound when someone, you know, just is tone deaf to what you need at that moment. And so you're sort of pointing out to that. Someone needs your support and you know the currency in which you can give that support and vice versa. And I think the Stoics are very, good on that. And I would point you to um, Seneca's on benefits. Great. Thank you. Thank you. So Laura Goulian wanted us to read out her question and, and get your answer. The question sure. is, what is the difference between rehearsing for loss and being a pessimist? It's great. Great question. I sometimes ask that very question. <laughs> Or what's the difference between pre-rehearsing loss? Another version of that question my, my students sometimes say, um, and getting traumatized, pre-traumatized. <laughs> um, so I'm not sure they're pessimists as much as eyes wide open. You know, again, I, was, I, I, I thought a lot about this during the pandemic and, you know, was I just gonna put my head in the sand or was I going to think a little bit about what would happen if I, you know, took these risks or those risks, that sort of thing. Um, and I, I think we are all better risk managers than we used to be um, as a result of this. And so I don't think that's pessimistic as much as um, not being naive about what the world can deliver or trying to think a few steps ahead, you know, um, you know, I, I would hate to put this on a geopolitical platform, so I won't, but, you know, in our personal lives, trying to think a little bit about this, or, or, you know, I guess you could think about environmental issues, certainly, not just thinking at the edge, you know, the end of it, what's at the end of your nose, but rather just being prudential. I think they're, they're ultimate prudential philosophers in some ways, but where they throw a lot of moral psychology into it. And that's kind of why they're interesting, I think. Thank you. My pleasure. So we have a comment from um, my colleague, Dan Mosley, who's in the Department of Psychiatry here at UNC, but trained as a philosopher. And he is the lead or faculty supervisor of the UNC Philosophy and Psychiatry Research Group. So a lot of themes of, of interest, I'm sure, in what, uh, what you're talking about. So Dan, let's hear from you. 
Well, yeah, thank you for the introduction, Sarah. And uh, thank you, Nancy, for the wonderful talk. And um, I just had a kind of quick, naive um, comment uh, about uh, some parallels that I noticed between some of the current debates about um, prolonged grief disorder, uh, which has just been added to the new uh, trade right. revision of the DSM-5. Right. Hmm. And, uh, you know, the, the, a lot of the criticism of the DSM-5 trade revision is that it um, is pathologizing ordinary life by treating grief after a year as something that's potentially pathological. So I was wondering if there's an, ex an extent to which the Stoics are also guilty in an important way of over overly pathologizing normal human emotions, that perhaps their fear of the excesses of grief and anger might be, uh, in, in a sense, a form of over pathologizing uh, these emotions. Right, in some ways, you know, and, and I always wondered, I mean, just to use that word, Kant, of course, talks about pathological inclinations and then practical ones. And, mm -hmm. and um, you know, they, he's picking up a little bit on, um, uh, on the terms that come up through Cicero, I think, morbus, uh, disease, uh, that sort of thing. So we get a lot of the bias against emotions through, sometimes through the Latin, not so much through the Greek, but through the Latin versions um, of these things. And they, they are very worried about the, you're right, they're very worried about the destabilizing aspects of emotions. And they want you, especially anger. Anger is the one that they're most concerned about. And it's actually anger, not all the varieties we think about, but it's anger at um, uh, a, a tyrant or a person of, of authorities, anger against someone who's subordinate, against a, you know, a servant, for example, enslaved. And some of that may just be prudential. You know, if you have a runaway slave, fugitive slaves were a real problem for the Romans who needed large retinues. So, um, so some of it is that, I think. Uh, it's sort of practical again. Um, but so they, you know, they, they hedge a bit because they have all these uh, pre-emotional experiences that are, that allow emotion in under the wire, kind of like under the sub-threshold wire. And then they have them on the other end. They have ways in which you can try to control them a little longer, whether or not, um, you know, under a year for grief would be one way in which you can control it. Yeah. So I agree. They, they, they are, um, emotions can, they're very concerned about the excess and irrationality of an emotion. And on the other, you know, and so their prescriptive aspect of account is problematic in some ways, but their descriptive account is really very prescient, I think, in having all these different um, layers of emotions and ways in which emotions are both cognitive and more subject to control than we often allow. They just don't happen to us in all cases. We can control some aspects of them if it's even if it's only the outer demeanor and not necessarily the the uh, experience inside Thank but you. i take your point and yes i i i know someone in, in amsterdam who was working on uh, prolonged grief disorder and um and i don't know enough en enough about it so i'm not an expert by any means thanks dan um, Michael or Juliana, I, I haven't asked you if, if my fellow quote unquote panelists uh, have any questions for Nancy. I'm sure. I mean, I, I uh, thank you so much for the, the wonderful talk. Um, I have many, but I'll ask one, one that comes to mind. And that's just this kind of nagging feeling I've always had uh, about the Stoics who I, I care deeply about and find very interesting and compelling in a lot of ways. Um, and it, so you painted this kind of attractive picture of the Stoic as, you know, they do have an emotional skin in the game. They do, uh, they are, you know, moved to pursue and to avoid in ordinary looking ways uh, as ordinary people would. Um, but that what's always kind of bothered me is not so much that they wouldn't be moved to pursue and avoid as ordinary people would, but that deep down, 
they're thinking of all their life projects, all their pursuits and avoidances, uh, like a game, like with the same detachment that you would find uh, in someone playing a game just for fun, not even sort of competitive games where people get a little overboard, you know, like March Madness. I mean, just the game, you know, like the unseriousness of a pickup game. Are we, in, are we in North Carolina right now? <laughs> <laughs> That's why I had to qualify. I don't mean the March Madness, the seriousness of March Madness. Um, I mean, sort of like the rec league um, that, yeah, that, you know, things have a kind of value insofar as they guide me to navigate the game. But in retrospect, in the rear view mirror, they're nothing. And that's what that's you know, only uh, a, a kind of thought that the world is providentially ordered and that it's all a good plan, no matter what happens, could, I think, make sense of that. And that's the sort of disturbing, potentially disturbing element. And I just wonder if you, is there a more attractive spin you could put on that? Um, <laughs> that's a yeah, it's a good, great question. I have never, you know, I'm interested in the one aspect of the cosmopolitanism in the, in the sense of uh, the glue or connection that um, brings a, and uh, precursor notions to the kingdom of ends, sort of the moral commonwealth, that kind of notion. Um, I'm not particularly, you know, um, enamored of any idea of infallibilism as the model. Um, a being in a cause, you know, if you really were in the cosmos in the right way, you would have a full grasp of what was going to happen, or 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 would be able so quickly to to get in sync that it would be in a nanosecond that sort of thing, and as you say, a providentially ordered cosmos probably would want you to be able to adjust that fast. Um, so that aspect is not of interest to me. There's so many pieces of, of stoicism. What's of interest to me and has always been of interest to me because I'm interested in the emotions is the sophisticated account of emotions they have. It's, it's just, it really does beat Aristotle, you know, and, and I'm an Aristotelian. Um, it's just so fascinating and it's much more interesting than Plato. Um, you know, but we, we can't read it easily because it's, well, bitty and piece, you know, it's here and there and fragments and stuff like that. Um, and what's interesting also is they're uh, taking very seriously how the Socratic project of know yourself and how you can try to um, become a better person through some self-knowledge and through the community that you're in. You know, they really take that to the nth degree. That's what that aspects, those are the aspects that are quite interesting to me. So I don't know anyone who, who grabs of any philosophy, frankly, and you know, who takes the whole thing and, um, and um, uh, says you have all or nothing. You know, I, I, I think we get to be good historians of philosophy by finding charitable reads and, and and credible reads on some, you know, I don't, I don't think they're the Stoics are the best on grief. I'm just, you know, I think it's an interesting problem for them. I think they're actually somewhat interesting on anger, but not fully. We know that the anger they're interested in is not, doesn't take into account my uh, righteous indignation, moral protest, um, rage against systemic injustice. That's not the anger they're interested in. And uh, Lordy and anger, if, if you want to use my Isha Cherry's um, adaptation of Audrey Lord, that's not the anger they're interested in. They're, they were interested in the anger that Nero might display toward those who were subordinate. That's, you know, narciss more, more like narcissistic injury, actually, um, which is only one small part of anger. <laughs> so. That is fascinating about the, the about the anger that you know that people are on about now and not even really being within the purview of their account. That that's very interesting. They're not speaking from the point of view of the servant, by the way. Although Seneca does, and many people have thought that he's you know a humanist in this regard. But I I think Moses Finley has put it kind of well, um, and that was that he, you know that it's a bit of a. Um, it, it, it was prudential for him to say those sorts of things to 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 the wealth to his fellow Romans who 
were worried about what would these enslaved persons say in court, you know, that you that you flogged them, uh, that you um, were a cruel master. You don't know, you know, they're just like you, you you're enslaved, right? And your freedom is inside. So they're enslaved too. That's one of the um, one of the ways it goes. But I think it's not. Um, I think it really is self-serving in some ways. Let's it's thank. Not, it's not the oh, humanitarian sorry, go ahead. View of enslavement. <laughs> I didn't mean to cut you off, not but we Please, we no, should we I should wrap answer. up. Yeah. Yes, yeah. we should. Let's thank our speaker for just a fascinating session. Thank you, Nancy. I can hear, I can hear, you know, I can hear the West Coast, as they say. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Michael and Juliana, and all of those that um, um, gave some uh, questions. My pleasure. And um, may we all go safely. <laughs> I don't know if you can see the, the 